He didn't do what I wanted him to. I got depressed all day. Three days later, I finally got over it. Next weekend, he didn't do what I wanted him to. I got depressed for three days. Finally got over it. Is anybody home? Look at me, let me tell you something. You are not gonna change people throwing fits. The Bible says, ye are holy. I think, well, I don't act holy. But holiness is in my spirit. And if I will work with the Holy Spirit and water the seed with the Word of God, <laughs> I will grow and develop little by little by little. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit that grows only under trial. It is useless to pray for patience. Well, actually, I encourage you to pray for patience, but I'll tell you what you'll get, trials. Ain't nobody too happy about this. Come on, listen. I know that if I say today, how many of you would like me to pray for you to have self-control? I could stay here and pray for people till midnight tonight. How many of you would stay if I would just lay hands on you and pray for you to have self-control? Well, you know what? It would be a waste of time. Because you are not going to have self-control because somebody prays for you to have self-control. You already have self-control. It is in you as a fruit of the Spirit, but it's little teeny, teeny, tiny seed. And nobody else can develop your fruit of the Spirit. Nobody else can develop your peace but you. Nobody can develop your joy but you. Nobody can develop your patience but you. And nobody can develop your discipline and self-control except you. Everybody sound excited and say, I got it, I got it, I really, really got it. <laughs> And the first thing we have to get over is thinking we don't have it. I just don't have any discipline. I just don't have any self-control. Well, I wish I looked like you, but I just don't have any self-control. I wish I wasn't overweight, but I just don't have any self-control. I wish I wasn't in debt, but I just don't have any self-control. I tell you, I get out in those malls, I just don't have any self-control. I tell you what, when I see chocolate chip cookies, I just can't eat one. I got to eat a dozen. I just don't have any self-control. But come on, you're just talking yourself right into the pit. You do have self-control. And you need to start looking at those cookies and say, if I want you, I'll eat you. And if I don't, I won't. <laughs> come on. Talk to that plate full of food. I am born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost. I have the power of the universe on the inside of me. And if I do not want to eat you, I will not eat you. expect to defeat the devil if you can't even defeat a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Some of you are afraid to even take it home. It's like, oh, I can't have that stuff in my house. If I do, I'll eat it. Come on now, you got to see yourself in a different light. And let me tell you something, you can control yourself if you want to. It seems like the only really spiritual people are over here. It's like... It just seems like every time I say something, it's kind of hard to swallow. They're the only bunch that's making any noise. All right, that's better. All right, let's try this again. You can control yourself if you really want to. And I want those of you watching by TV shouting too. I'll tell you how I know that you can control yourself 
and I'll just give you an example, you'll get it. If you were in a full-fledged emotional temper tantrum in your house and I knocked on your front door, Let me tell you what, you would get control of yourself <laughs> and it would only take a few seconds. And God had to show me that in my own life because I was making that same excuse. I just can't help it. God, I can't help it. I, can't. God, I just can't help it. You know how I've been raised, God. I just can't help it. <laughs> Nothing changes until we take responsibility for our actions. And listen, what I'm going to say is very important. And we start doing in private for God what we do occasionally to impress people. <laughs> Now, if you were acting bad and I came to your door, you would straighten up to impress me. But God was there before I got to the door. And until we learn to live before that audience of one and to live for His glory, not for the admiration of people, then we're never going to consistently do what's right. We might do what's right when we're being watched, but we won't do what's right when we think nobody's watching. And I will just go ahead and be bold and say, that stinks in the nostrils of God. Because then we're living as people pleasers, not God pleasers. One day I was walking down a hotel hall and I had a cup full of ice. It was after a conference and I, some of the ice fell out. I kicked it over in the corner and kept going. <laughs> And of course, the Holy Ghost immediately began to deal with me to go back and pick it up. <laughs> But let me ask you a question. If I would have been walking down that hotel hall and done that, and somebody from my conference would have been coming this way, God wouldn't have had to tell me nothing. I would, oh. It's really kind of funny when we leave these meetings and we get out in the traffic. We try to get out ahead of it, but if we get out in the traffic, <laughs> it's really funny to watch somebody that's not going to let us in until they realize it's us. Oh. <laughs> Well, you guys are with me today, aren't you? So you can control yourself. All of this moodiness and this up and down stuff, a lot of it is just liberties that you take. Because in some ways, to be honest, we use all that to try to get people to feel sorry for us. And we think we're going to get God to feel sorry for us, and He don't. God is not into pity. He has real compassion, but he's not into pity. I tried to use that self-pity card for years and years and years. And Dave would look at me sometimes, and I mean, tell you one of the hardest things this man said to me. I mean, I would be going through some... <laughs> And I'd say, you don't understand. I need you to minister to me. You don't understand. He'd say, no, you want me to feel sorry for you, and I'm not going to feel sorry for you. Yeah. And come on, ladies. There are times when we need understanding, but if the truth is told, sometimes we're just using those emotions to get pity, and that's the last thing we need because the only way to kill the flesh is to starve it.
You say, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Well, I can't say that you guys have not been an exciting bunch to preach to. That's... It makes it a whole lot easier, I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay, Colossians 3. This is something that so many Christians are not taught. And the reason why I was in such a mess, even though I was born again for so many years, was I never heard the terminology, die to self. I never understood that I had some wonderful things in my spirit, but I still had a mess in my soul. And Paul talked about soulish, carnal Christians. And he was talking to people that had the gifts of the Spirit. They spoke in tongues and operated in other gifts of the Spirit. And yet he said, you are carnal. You are men of the flesh because you let your natural nature predominate. Okay, so listen, here's one of my favorite statements. We are never going to enjoy stability. We're never going to enjoy spiritual maturity. Now, are you ready? Until we learn how to do what's right when it feels wrong. We have to learn how to do what's right when it still feels wrong. And every time you do what's right by a decision of your will, using discipline and self-control to go beyond how you feel, the more painful it is in your flesh, the more you're growing spiritually at that particular moment. I used to just go wild when we would come home from one of these conferences and Dave would want to go play golf. I mean, I went into my robot mode, what about me, what about me, what about me, what about me? I mean, I felt sorry for myself. I'd get moody. Here I'd been preaching my heart out to people all weekend, seeing people, seeing people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and healed and delivered and set free. Now, 24 hours later, I'm because Dave wanted to go play golf. And he just kept going. And I just kept throwing fits, okay? When I finally decided, even though I felt like having a fit, I wasn't going to let it out. the beginning of self-control is you don't have to say everything you feel. I said the beginning of self-control is you don't have to say everything you feel. And you don't have to do everything you feel. But I tell you what, when I stopped giving voice to it, the pain stayed in me. And it was just like, Is anybody with me? God, you better get him out of here quick because I can only stand this a few more seconds. Oh, it hurt so bad. God. I got so sick and tired of me. What about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? It's just like, ah. I didn't want to be locked up in that prison anymore. I didn't want my whole day to be ruined because somebody decided to go do something I didn't want them to do. Come on, if you want to have freedom, you're going to have to stop letting what other people do control your joy.
So you start by having those feelings, but now you're no longer going to give expression to them. You're no longer going to vent them. And you're doing it for God because that's what He asked you to do. Colossians 3, 5 says, So kill, deaden, deprive of power the evil desire lurking in your members, those animal impulses and all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin, that is sexual vice, impurity, sensual appetites, unholy desires, and all greed and covetousness, for that is idolatry. So what do you do about the flesh? Kill it. Okay, so I, you know, my little practical mind, I'm having these prayer sessions with God. Okay, God, I know I'm supposed to kill the flesh, supposed to die to self, but how do I do that? <laughs> how can I get to the point where I don't feel this way? And here's very simply what he told me. Stop feeding it. Now, now just listen. Because every time you feed something, you keep it alive. Every time you feed it, you keep it alive. Okay, so every time that he wanted to go play golf and I didn't want him to, or every time he wanted to watch a football game and I didn't want him to, and I would start trying to convince him and I'd try my self-pity and my talking and all this, and nothing was working. He was going to do what he was going to do. Okay, so now I got this rage in me. And I'm starting to go into my self-pity mode. Everything is sinking. Now we're going to go to the back of the house and sit on the floor in the bathroom. <laughs> Lay our head on the toilet. <laughs> and what God began to show me is you have to stop giving in to that. You have to use the fruit of self-control that I've put in you and even though maybe in the natural you'd like for him to have a miserable time I want you to go out there kiss him put your arms around him and say honey have a good time Woo! <laughs> that's close to a nervous breakdown level Okay, I'd practice. Honey, have a good time. Hallelujah. Have a good time. Okay, now listen, when I first would do something like that, or I would just choose to not say anything negative. You know, I had to start, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't able to say anything good. I had to start by not saying anything bad. And I'll be honest, sometimes I just had to go stay in another part of the house because if I got around him, I was gonna pop my mouth off for sure. Come on, I got some relatives out here today. But you see, I just didn't want to keep going around and around that same stupid mountain, around and around and around and around, that same dumb mountain. He didn't do what I wanted him to. I got depressed all day. Three days later, I finally got over it. Next weekend, he didn't do what I wanted him to. I got depressed for three days, finally got over it. Is anybody home? Look at me, let me tell you something. You are not going to change people throwing fits. <laughs> Work on yourself. Go home, let all your relatives off the potter's wheel. You are not the potter. And instead of worrying about what they're doing, Get more concerned about your reaction to what they're doing. Because here's the thing, you never know what people are going to do. I mean, you just never know what people are going to do. And so if you don't have yourself under control, now you're a slave to everybody out there because whatever they decide to do 
can control and manipulate you. So when I started just keeping my mouth shut, not saying anything, then it finally escalated to the point where that wasn't so painful anymore. <laughs> See, the absence of pain means death. So when something no longer bothers you, you've died to that thing. Now see, I've come full circle in this now to where when we go home from a conference, I suggest to Dave that he go out and play golf. Because I want the remote control. I want space. I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and I want it quiet. So I'm like, Honey, I think you deserve to play a little golf. Why don't you go out and play some golf? <laughs> When I think about all the years, the nightmare mood swings that I had because of that stuff that was so stupid. And I'm telling you, the only way that you're going to develop this fruit of discipline and self-control and patience and an even temper is if you start doing what's right when it still feels wrong and as you do it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, day after day after day, you start to farm new habits and at first it is going to hurt so bad that you think there is no way that I can keep my mouth shut. That's when you say, help me God, help me, help me God, help me. <laughs> help me God, help me, help me, help me. Come on, I'm asking you to live for God's glory. I'm asking you to do it for Him. I'm asking you to become stable so you can be a witness in an unstable world. We don't have to fall apart because of the price at the gas pumps and the economy. God is our source. He'll provide for us and meet our needs. And not only that, if you have to not take a few trips or you have to not buy a few things you would ordinarily buy, big deal. Your joy is not in that anyway. <laughs> Suck it up and make a few changes and let's don't be so whiny about everything. The way you kill something is don't feed it. Just stop feeding it. You got to start doing what's right when it still feels wrong. Let me tell you something. I spend time every morning in my private time with God preparing for this stable lifestyle I'm determined to go out and live. I spend time every morning thinking about how I want to behave that day. I put on behavior just like I put on my clothes. Well, I wish I was patient. No, 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 no. You put on patience. You put it on. You don't have to feel patient to be patient. You don't have to feel confident to be confident. You don't have to feel loving to go love people. That's why we have to think about emotional stability. Because as long as we keep following our emotions, there will be no stability. Because they are fickle, they're up and down and all over the place and you never know from one minute to the next how they're going to do or how you're going to feel. Say, I have self-control. I, I am stable. I am, I am disciplined. I am, I am not moody. Amen. Amen. Well, as you learned today from our program, I had many opportunities in my life to develop emotional stability. And it really does take some discipline to learn how to control those emotions rather than letting them control you. And I do believe that spending time with God and putting Him first is one of the things that brings stability into our life.
Psalm 91.1 says that when we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, we remain stable, and I love that. But I know that I know that I know that the Word of God is true and that He changes lives and He gives you a life worth living. Misschien ken je Joyce Meyer van haar boeken of van haar programma Enjoying Everyday Life. Maar wist je dat Joyce Meyer Ministries ook overal ter wereld concrete humanitaire hulp biedt? Door middel van voedselverstrekking, ziekenhuizen, noodhulp bij rampen, het bevrijden van slachtoffers van mensenhandel en nog veel meer. Deze christelijke hulporganisatie heet Hand of Hope en draait volledig op giften. Early on, mom and dad, you know, really just started to realize just how full the Bible is with uh, mandates that we're supposed to take care of the poor. You know, it talks all the time about visiting those that are in prison and feeding the hungry and you know taking in the stranger and, and taking care of the widow and the orphan. And so we strive to do that. And as the ministry has grown, our, our ability to influence and do bigger things has also grown. You know, as we travel around the world, we meet so many wonderful children that have had such desperate need in their life. And we're so grateful to be able to help them. Today, we happen to be in Thailand. And this little boy's name is Somded. And he's had some tragic things in his life, but thank God, through your help, he's now living in the children's home here, and his life is looking very bright. His parents both died when he was six in an auto accident. And when they found him to bring him here to the home, he had had severe ear infections, which had caused hearing loss and lots of other problems in his ears. So he's had about two years of medical treatment on his ears, and thank God he can hear fine now. And so thank you for helping us provide homes for some dead and for other little boys and girls like him all around the world. Over Jezus vertellen en mensen laten zien dat God van ze houdt. Ja, de vele noden op de wereld gaan de mens te boven. En misschien vraag je jezelf af of je er überhaupt wel iets aan kunt doen. Maar dat kan dus wel degelijk. Hand of Hope, de christelijke hulporganisatie van Joyce Meyer Ministries, is daar het bewijs van. Alles in één keer oplossen gaat niet. Maar wij bieden mensen één voor één de helpende hand. De zon gaat op en de wereld is mooi. Maar dan ineens stormopkomst. Laat je niet door je gevoelens leiden. Joyce Meyer laat je zien hoe het anders kan. In haar boek Emoties in Balans. Bestel het boek Emoties in Balans nu via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed, het is het waard.